We're proud to welcome you to the Exceptional Advisor podcast series brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. This series aims to help you to better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences. Hi, I'm your host, Bob Powell. My guest today is Dwayne Thompson, the president of Potomac Strategies. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Dwayne. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here, Bob. It's great to have you. Um, and before we get started, if you don't mind, for the benefit of our listeners who may not be familiar with you and your work, do you mind giving us a brief overview? Sure. Well, uh, I've been involved in either uh, government relations and policy analysis, mostly, uh, obviously, financial services for the last 30 years. And uh, for the last 10, I've had the pleasure of working with the Investments and Wealth Institute, tra- tracking the kinds of issues that uh, impact wealth managers and financial planners. And uh, I guess we're going to look at a couple, two recent uh, rules that came out. Yeah, so let's dive in. So there are these two uh, pieces of regulations that impact advice to retail investors, the SEC's Investment Advisor Marketing Rule and the Department of Labor's Mm -hmm. recent exemption for conflicted investment advice by ERISA fiduciaries. Uh, Start where you want to start with the marketing rule? Yeah, well, let's let's go there. That's pretty interesting. And and the history uh, actually goes back to 1961. So I imagine some people in the audience may not even have been born. <laughs> I was, but uh, when this when this rule uh, this rule came out, uh, and some people refer to it as the client testimonial rule. Uh, you know, but but it all it, it's much broader than that. It involves advertising by investment advisors. And so that rule, uh, again, came out uh, 40, uh, 60 years ago. And uh, but obviously at the time, the media that you could advertise in was more limited. You basically had you had three networks, uh, television networks. You had, you know, uh, radio stations and newspapers. And uh, today, of course, you look around and there's such a proliferation of uh, different ways to uh, reach prospective clients. Uh, you know, when, when the SEC uh, uh, approved this rule last December, uh, they, they gave a, a very uh, vague rationale. They said with, uh, it reflects market developments and uh, changes to advertising and referral practices. And so uh, it's about time we did something about it, but actually, uh, you know, I've been going up to the SEC meeting with uh, folks up there for, for years, and even 10, 20 years ago, they were joking, ha- you know, half joking about saying, well, we got we to gotta update this rule. But I think uh, actually uh, what really pushed them to get going on this was social media. You know, uh, you know, and, and it can it can trip up an advisor who in good faith, let's say they have a LinkedIn site and they get a thumbs up from a client, you know, that's an endorsement. <laughs> that's a testimonial. Uh, and so if you, if you step back and look at it over these 60 years, uh, the SEC, because you, you, they never really defined uh, what a testimonial was, uh, they ended up putting out what, you know, what a no action letter is. That means you know, you say, if I do this, am I going to be in violation of the rules? So the SEC looks at it and says, you know, if you do what you say you're going to do, we wouldn't recommend enforcement action. So that's what a no action letter is. And so they've issued 400 no action letters over this time period. So there was, you know, there was a lot of clutter and, you know, uh, probably confusion and uncertainty. And uh, but but the bottom line is, up until this past December, for the last 60 years, you could not, uh, client testimonials were banned. Uh, I've seen some no action letters in the past uh, that, uh, well, actually, no, uh, prohibitions or guidance from the SEC, where if you had a client that said, uh, Joe over here, my advisor is is a, a great guy great guy. They, they're not saying anything about your investment acumen or experience. They're just saying he's a good guy in the community. He goes to my church or synagogue. I like him. He's a solid citizen. Um, and that's prohibited. 
<laughs> you know, so, so, uh, and, and I'll give you one other quick example. Um, uh, this is when I was working for uh, the Financial Planning Association, uh, literally 25 years ago, uh, one of its predecessors, I got a call from a panicked investment advisor, a member, uh, I think he was in Connecticut, said the SEC just showed up at my door. Uh, they're doing, you know, one of their regular examinations. And they asked me where my uh, solicitation agreement was because I'm a part of your referral program. Now, that's another rule I'm going to talk about in a second that's related to this, the cash solicitation rule. But basically, under, under that rule, if you pay someone uh, compensation for a referral, you know, uh, then, uh, you know, you got to meet this other rule that requires some uh, disclosures and other things. And so he paid a modest fee to be listed, uh, you know, uh, with the organization to get referrals. And so we panicked a little bit. We said, what? You know, we're not out there soliciting. Uh, maybe you pay 50, 75 bucks extra a year or something for this listing and uh, you get you may get referrals so it didn't seem to fit so that and and we, we went in and got a no action letter so that's the kind of things that I think the SEC also said look you know we're spending too much time trying to explain this rule so social media came in so you know uh, Facebook and other you know other LinkedIn and all this so Dwayne, Back let me 20... interrupt you for a second one, yeah. one of the things when the SEC first put this rule in place um, the thought was that um, that the experience of one client may not be representative of the entire entire client base. Is that sort of uh, that's a, that's an excellent point because uh, as you as you know with other businesses, uh, you know you can see all kinds of commercials and ads. Uh, I, this my plumber's great and all this kind of stuff. That's okay. <laughs> but if you're a fiduciary, and and I think that's what distinguishes even from uh, stockbrokers uh, who can, to a certain certain extent, uh, uh, have testimonials. But when you're a fiduciary, like you said, uh, this one client may have uh, had a great experience with you, but that the SEC said that may not be representative of all your clients. So uh, that's why uh, being a fiduciary puts you in a special position of confidence and trust with the client. And the SEC was very concerned about that. And uh, so it's, it's kind of been this uh, wall that you hit if you're saying, well, how do I market my firm? Well, uh, yeah, and, and you have clients who love you. You know, you, you and I, I, over the years, have talked to, uh, that's part of satisfaction, right, of uh, being an uh, a, a advisor is uh, helping out your clients and having this uh, great relationship. And uh, they probably want to say, how can I help you? And yeah. they've, well, refer me, you know, I think that's the, the base, you know, what I've heard over, over time, you know, it's, it's always referrals. Uh, and uh, that, and of course, that's great. But if you want to really, ex especially if you're starting out, and you want to expand your business and advertise, that's, forget about the testimonials and endorsements or a, a, the cash solicitation to get referrals is another one. So uh, I don't want to, I don't want to get bogged down, but let me just go quickly because- sure. This rule also sort of consolidates. The SEC was thinking of actually uh, just updating both rules, but then it said, let's put them together. So in 1979, uh, the SEC adopted what's called a cash solicitation rule. And again, uh, it wanted to have uh, these solicitors, they were called solicitors who refer clients to you for, for compensation uh, to disclose that uh, they have a financial incentive and a, and a conflict of interest to say, hey, this is a great guy, a <laughs> great advisor, but <laughs> he's paying me, uh, he, whether it was cash or something else. So you need to, you needed to jump through some hoops, give, give the client a copy of the agreement and uh, the current uh, form ADV and, and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, the SEC finally stepped back uh, when in 2014, they looked at social media. I think that was a driver uh, behind this. They eased up on the pedal a little bit and said, you know, as long as you don't, if, if someone on a third party website uh, says something nice about you, uh, you can uh, put a link to that on your website. So they started to ease up a little bit. 
Um, but you can't cherry pick, you know, if, if it's something from Yelp, uh, three people loved you, one person thought you weren't so great. Uh, you got to put all, all four of them on, you know, you can't, can't cherry pick and things like that. And so finally they started look at this and said, let's, uh, let's just update the whole thing. And, and hopefully if we make it more principles based, uh, we won't have to get all these no action letters and respond all the time. And, and so they're hoping that uh, irrespective of what kind of technology you're using to advertise, uh, they're not going to have to go back every year or so and, and, and take a lot of their time and energy and, and advisors to give them guidance. Now, I don't think that's going to stop. I think there's going to be questions that pop up. And if you want me to give you a quick overview of what is what has changed, uh, let, let me just uh, give give a, uh, you know, it, it would take uh, hours to, to dig into sure. all of this. So we'll do the Cliff Notes version then. Yeah, yeah, this is the, the Cliff Notes version. And uh, essentially, there's there's a couple key changes to keep in mind. I think one of the most important uh, previously uh, an advertisement, which incl would include testimonials and other things, would be communications to 10 or more persons. Uh, ironically, now they're cutting it down to more than one person uh, is considered an advertisement if you put something out about uh, uh, your services and, and all of that. So it's been broadened and you have to keep records on it. Um, but on, on the other hand, you can, uh, you, you know, use testimonials now, uh, but they've also, the SEC has also defined uh, a difference. They, they're using a little bit different terminology. So where they called uh, people solicitors for cash payments, they're now calling them promoters. So for example, uh, anyone listening to this, they have a compliance person or attorney that they use. Uh, uh, they're going to start talking about promoters. Uh, uh, and also there's a difference between testimonials and endorsements. So a testimonial, when the SEC talks about that or your compliance guy does, uh, a testimonial is by a current client, okay? But an endorsement where someone says, uh, go see this guy, it could be like a celebrity endorsement. It's kind of like that. It's someone other than a current client, and in this case, a, a promoter. And the other tricky part uh, where, uh, where you, you, they also, the SEC also looked at third party ratings. So I think we've all seen in, in magazines, uh, uh, worth uh, top 100 advisors, things like that. Um, you had to be careful before previously. Um, and and I'm, I'm guessing the SEC had no action letters on this, how you use it, because you may have your monthly or quarterly uh, client newsletter. And, you know, if you're fortunate enough, you're, you've, you're one of the top advisors uh, selected by this magazine. Well, that's OK. You can you can use that uh, in your marketing or your client communications. But you have to disclose clearly and prominently. So I'm giving you one example on this. You have to put the date of the rating and the time period on which it was based. Uh, so if it was a magazine, it was this issue and so forth and, and the identity of the party that did it. So here's the publication. Uh, now, if there's some of those uh, situations where you pay some compensation for the rating, you would have to disclose that. So, uh, so the, the one thing I would draw from this uh, is to say, while this is a, a wonderful marketing opportunity uh, for uh, advisors, especially where they want to use client testimonials and instead of just uh, rely, on, rely on referrals, um, you have to be really careful uh, because, as they say, the devil's always in the details. Now, uh, you know, the rule actually goes into effect May 4th. So yeah. after that time, you can start using client testimonials. Uh, but there's a difference between in, in when an agency puts out an effective date and a compliance deadline. Uh, they're usually two different things. So you can do it. And there's a compliance deadline of November 4th, 2022. In other words, 18 months out uh, when it really goes into effect. 
that's uh, that's the way I look at it. Um, so so what does that mean? That just means you have to be real careful. And I think if you make a minor slip up in what you've you know, in, in doing this, uh, using the endorsements, ratings, or, or testimonials, and the SEC comes in and looks at your books and records, they may ding you, they, they might put something in the deficiency letter. If you're not going over the top and doing something misleading and, you know, uh, really embellishing uh, <laughs> things, right. uh, telling the client, well, here's what you, you should say, all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so do you mind if I interrupt for just yeah. a quick second? But this is what I understand. So if, if I'm Bob Powell, RIA, and, and you're Dwayne Thompson, my client, and you say, Bob has done a really nice job of helping me achieve the retirement I desire, quote, unquote, and I, and I print that in a newspaper ad or publish it, it on, on my website. Facebook or yeah. LinkedIn account, yeah. that's, that's going to that, that's gonna be okay. Now, and you can even, uh, I really appreciate this, Bob, but you could give me a nice dinner uh, too. <laughs> uh, say thank you. Okay. I appreciate that. As long as it's under a thousand bucks. Now, maybe if I'm in Boston, we might run into problems there, but no, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, but but that's, yeah. that's one of the exemptions. If, uh, if the endorsement or the testimonial is, you know, the compensation being paid to the party is under a thousand dollars, then you don't have to go through a lot of these disclosures and other things. So I, I was, you know, kind of using that in a, in a joking way to say that uh, there's a, a de minimis amount uh, where you can, yeah. pay someone or, or compensate them. Uh, but uh, if, if it goes over that, you, you know, where you're actually paying someone uh, to do that, then that becomes an endorsement or you have to disclose for the testimonial of a client. But I, I you know, I think in, in the, the situation you just described, uh, that's, what, that's what we're going to see with a, a lot of advisors. They have clients who love them and then you say, hey, can I, can I uh, put put a written, uh, and, and, you know, testimonial from you on my, on my website or something like that. Right. It's not going to be a problem. You just want to be careful. Now, uh, I'll just mention one other area of the, of this rule that gets really, uh, complicated and that's portfolio performance, you know, your performance, uh, you know, people are going to naturally ask you about that. And all I can say is, uh, this gets into really complicated territory. Yeah. Um, and there's different kinds of performance, related performance, uh, extracted performance, uh, hypothetical performance, uh, predecessor perform, you know, things like where I used to be on a, a, a team of advisors and we had some really good portfolios and things like that. You would like to use that. So that's, uh, extract, uh, that's related perfor- per- no, predecessor performance, or for example, extracted performance is taking a subset of, of your investment portfolios and uh, using that to illustrate, you know, your, your investment uh, uh, skills and so forth. So all I can say is talk to your compliance person. And if you get into portfolio performance, uh, be real careful. Yeah, it strikes me that that's a, um, a, a bit of a sticky wicket because you might have clients that have growth oriented portfolios and some have income oriented and some have conservative or preservation portfolios. And they want to say, and, what can uh, you do for me? Right. And, and, and let me just tell you, uh, it, it's pretty obvious because the, that rule is over 400 pages. Okay. And, and, and maybe this is, uh, this, this is my rule of thumb. I just do a word search sometimes through the document. So for example, a 430 page rule, uh, I looked at hypothetical performance and, and that phrase is mentioned 278 times. Uh, the others related performance, other are about 70 times each. Uh, but it just shows you that that's an area of concern for the SEC. So again, uh, if, if you want to make, sh- look out for some areas where the SEC is going to express concerns or you might have problems, it's going to be in portfolio performance and how and how you advertise it uh, in your in your client communications. The other thing I would say is uh, talking to your existing your current clients uh, about your services and so forth. And, and you could that that may be the newsletter that you send out to all of them. 
uh, that's fine. You know, that doesn't really fit under the uh, perform advertising rule and so forth, except if you're offering a new service or something, uh, then there's a potential where that would come under this uh, advertising rule where you have to keep records and other things and be a little bit more careful. So uh, I think there's a lot of good news in this. I'll mention one other thing. Well, do you, th you know, how will advisors use this? Um, I just saw a study this morning, I, I think it was by American Funds, where they said advisors rely too much on referrals. They, <laughs> it's one of those stories. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, maybe that's all you need to do uh, you know, if, if, if they're spreading. Uh, but again, like I said, if, if you're a new advisor or, you know, you're young, tech savvy and and you want to grow your business, you may say, oh, these testimonials are great. So uh, it's really hard to say uh, how, how this will be used. And I would say, OK, we're still in, in the middle of this uh, public health emergency with with the pandemic. And so you're really not getting out uh, probably as much and circulating face to face. So it may be that advisors that, uh, you know, used to go out and, and invite a prospective client to dinner or, or some, some an event, sports event or something like that, where they're not, you know, so they may say, hey, well, this is, uh, this is a good way to uh, really uh, be able to market myself. And I, I have to think that uh, for the folks who are listening to this, members of the Investments Wealth Institute, uh, that there will be a good number of RIAs who start to in incorporate testimonials into their advertising, and, and that to not do so may be to be left behind because everyone will be promoting the fact that their clients love them. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, are, are you looking at your, your uh, competition in, in your city or something, and suddenly you start seeing uh, testimonials pop up uh, on the on the f main page of, of their website and you say I gotta I want to keep up yeah so, uh, what, what I mean what what do you think could go if you're an advisor aside from getting in you know getting into trouble with the SEC you know what what's what's the downside to doing this from your perspective is, is there a is there something that people need to be wary of as they think about this? Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. To, yeah, I'll go back to the original premise uh, for this rule: is you're a fiduciary. You so there's a lot of documentation involved in almost anything you do, uh, and this rule is no different. So if you say, "Yeah, uh, testimonials are great. I love them." Uh, just make sure you understand uh, the rules, the constraints, and, and make sure you're in compliance. And, and again, this rule has enough uh, tricky parts to it. Uh, you want to uh, talk to your compliance person uh, before you really uh, take a deep, deep dive into this, because there's enough tricky parts into it, uh, in it that uh, you want to be careful. You know, let's keep the lawyers busy, I guess. Yeah. I, we, we won't dive into this now, but years <laughs> ago when I worked at Dalbar, I was among the hundreds of people that asked applied for a no action letter uh, on the testimonial rule, and we did receive one. And it, it, it ultimately it entailed us being able to survey the entire uh, client base of an advisor and then use the aggregate rating as, uh, as oh, evidence. I, I remember I, I, I read the Dalbar no action letter and, and all that. And they, they did, it, it illustrated uh, that, uh, that that would be, you know, under this rule, a, 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 you know, a third party rating, uh, I, I guess. And, and uh, you had to be real, the advisor was sort of arm's length away from, from the ratings that were done and so forth. So yeah, that's a perfect example of why the SEC will, is still, will still be concerned in, in how ratings are, are used by an investment advisor. Yeah. So um, do you want to turn our attention to the, uh, the Department of Labor rule um, with yeah. respect to, uh, great. So Okay. I'll, well, I'll leave the drive uh, to you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, well, this is another rule which which is typical at the end of an administration. Uh, an agency takes takes a while to uh, to get going to get uh, con confirmation of of the political appointees and so forth. And so this was a rule that was uh, kind of neglected because this is an exemption for giving conflicted advice under ERISA. And ERISA is the highest standard uh, under law for uh, fiduciaries. So uh, the SEC took, uh, and of course, there was that controversy. This goes back to 20, 
uh, 16, when the Obama administration uh, came, came, came out with a fiduciary rule and uh, industry groups challenged it. And finally, and I think it was March of 2018, uh, that rule was overturned. So I'm, I'm just uh, framing this. And, and so in the absence of that, where a lot of industry groups were relying on uh, several different exemptions to give advice because simply because, uh, you know, I, I don't think conflicted is necessarily a dirty word. It, and, and under ERISA, it means that you have a conflict because, uh, <clears throat> you know, you got a commission and you had to be able to, as a broker or insurance producer, and you had to be able to um, uh, uh, disclose, disclose the conflict of interest because, uh, you you technically at least had had an incentive uh, to push maybe certain products to your client or recommend certain products to your clients over over others, and so uh, you, you, so what the SEC rather what the Department of Labor did was broaden the definition of fiduciary uh, to create a higher standard for brokers and insurance people who you know uh, recommended annuities and, and retirement accounts and so forth. Whereas investment advisors as fiduciaries probably were already in this space, although, again, this is a higher fiduciary standard than actually what you had under the Advisors Act. And, and, one of, and you say, why? What's the difference? Uh, one of those is that you have to benchmark your compensation. It has to be reasonable. Uh, and, and so an investment advisor, certainly, you know, if, if you're way out of whack, but usually, you know, as, as on with uh, retail, retail clients and, and taxable accounts, um, you know, as long as you're within the uh, ballpark of, of what uh, other advisors charged, you were okay, but the SEC wasn't likely to come in and uh, say, well, your benchmark is, you know, you're not really close to the benchmark of what, of say, 1% assets under management, uh, you know, things like that. They're not as, as sticky uh, in that area as ERISA is. Plus, uh, you can be sued there, uh, by, by clients uh, directly and not have to go into arbitration under ERISA. There's what's called a private right of action. So, so I, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, that's uh, when you're dealing with retirement accounts and giving advice either to the plan or to the individual account holder, uh, you have a higher standard when you're dealing with IRAs and 401k accounts and things like that. Uh, so uh, what happened, the, you know, the uh, Fifth Circuit overturned the Obama rule and uh, what the uh, Trump uh, Department of Labor did was put in a sort of a temporary enforcement policy. They said, well, okay, you can give conflicted advice uh, as long as you adhere to what was called the impartial conduct standards. And that's basically, uh, you know, the duty of loyalty and prudence, you know, make sure the, you know, you're acting in the client's best interest. The uh, recommendation is suitable at the, at the time it was made that you uh, only charge reasonable compensation that, that I mentioned earlier. And you, you don't omit important information or make misleading statements and things like that. So it was pretty basic. And uh, in the meantime, <clears throat> you know, the Department of Labor and statements and the SEC uh, both said, we'll let the SEC take the lead this time. So that's when we saw a regulation best interest come out. And because the SEC doesn't uh, regulate annuities other than variable annuities. That's left up to the states. The state insurance commissioners came out with their version of Reg BI, regulation best interest for annuity transactions. And Johnny come lately is <laughs> it's Department of Labor, uh, but they wanted the SEC to take the lead. So uh, they are trying to roughly, uh, um, you know, provide the same type of uh, safe harbor uh, or, you know, for conflicted advice uh, that the SEC put into place for brokers. Uh, but there, there are some differences because just the, the statutory requirements under ERISA are different from uh, the 34 Act and FINRA rules, but they're not that different. Uh, but anyway, let me let me just give you, uh, you know, just just the, the short what's what's the what's new under the, the Department of Labor's rule. It pretty much brings in the impartial conduct standards that were under that temporary enforcement policy. 
And uh, then it just adds uh, a little bit more paperwork. You have to make required disclosures uh, of those conflicts. You have to try and mitigate any conflicts of interest. And then I think this is the, the two er real important areas. The first is that you have to have a senior executive in your, <clears throat> excuse me, in your firm, uh, sign off, uh, do an annual review and a sign off on policies and procedures designed to, you know, to, to uh, have compliance uh, with this rule. But in some ways, it's really not that different. If you're already regulated under regulation best interest, there's really a not, not a lot of differences. Now, of course, one interesting aspect is under the DOL rule, you have to disclose fiduciary status. So that's kind of, it's kind of a, uh, an irony in a way. So you may be, uh, you know, a, a broker and, uh, you know, where you don't have, you know, Reg, Reg BI says, look, you're not a fiduciary. They, they say that up front. Whereas, you know, you may be a, a registered rep and you're giving advice to a, a client using the safe harbor. Well, I'm a fiduciary. So that, that's one of the reasons consumers get so confused because yeah. here's one person <laughs> giving advice on the same account. Uh, I don't think they're gonna go out of their way to, to explain this, that I'm this conundrum that, okay, I'm a fiduciary under ERISA, but I'm not <laughs> under securities <laughs> law. But that's, that's, that's the way this stuff operates because you, know, you have different overlapping laws that may apply. Now, the other important area is um, that, uh, as I mentioned, there was this old five-part definition that the Department of Labor put in place in 1975 uh, that basically made you a functional fiduciary if you met all five parts of this test. So outside of investment advisors, uh, most brokers and insurance producers were able to rely uh, because they never met all five prongs of this test, so they weren't fiduciaries. So uh, they could give advice and uh, uh, to, to plans and, and to 401k accounts and all that without getting dragged into fiduciary status. And uh, I'm not gonna get into the five part test other than the key part is you have to give advice on securities or investments on a regular basis. So if you just sell a, a annuity, product uh, to put in someone's account, IRA or something, and you're not going to be meeting with them on a regular basis, you're not going to be a fiduciary. You're not going to meet that standard. However, uh, what the Department of Labor did do with this latest prohibited transaction exemption was say that if you give rollover advice, and that's a big deal right now, it's been that way for uh, eight or nine years for regulators to look at rollover advice to see what kind of conflicts of interest you can't casually say, yeah, I'll take it and put it in an IRA without doing some due diligence work. Uh, but uh, what the Department of Labor said here is that if you expect to meet on a regular basis with this client, once they roll over their assets, whether it's to another 401k plan or to an IRA, et cetera. So you're going to be giving them advice on a regular basis on this rollover distribution, then you're a fiduciary. You meet that regular basis test. And so, uh, so that's an area uh, again, you know, I know most uh, in, investment wealth institute members are already investment advisors and fiduciaries and they charge AUM and so forth. So it's probably not going to be a big, as big of a deal for them. But if it's someone who uh, uh, it isn't normally operating as a fiduciary, they're a tr truly registered rep they, and so forth, uh, they, have to, they have to pay attention uh, to, to this, uh, you know, rollover advice, you have to, you know, do, uh, hopefully document the basis and explain the reason for the rollover because and you have to look at factors that might suggest uh, that they shouldn't roll over, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe the uh, uh, it, it administrate, you know, the administration of, of the 401k account isn't being paid through the plan. Uh, the plan sponsor, the company is paying it all out of, out of pocket. Uh, so 
uh, typically the fees for the, for the uh, client go up when they move out of a plan. And, and you may have institutional share classes in the plan because uh, you have more purchasing power. So the investment cost is going to be much lower. Plus, uh, if you hadn't been uh, advised by a, a wealth manager or so forth, and they go into an IRA, then, then you know, they stand, the, the advisor stands to benefit. So they have a conflict of interest in suggesting they roll over and you manage the assets and so forth. So that's always been uh, for the last seven or eight years for uh, the Department of Labor, SEC, states, <laughs> FINRA, uh, rollover advice. So uh, that to me, that's uh, one of the big parts uh, that uh, someone who needs to look, who's looking at rollover advice for the client needs to look at, well, how am I registered uh, in providing this advice? What capacity? Am I giving them advice as a registered rep or as an investment advisor and so forth? And do I, do I need this safe harbor? So mm-hmm. it just, it just gets really tricky. And uh, I think, uh, you know, in terms of whenever the, those two words come up, rollover advice, uh, be real careful, uh, make sure you do your due diligence and make sure that uh, if you are going to recommend a rollover, that it's in, in, in their best interest. And it may be that, yes, it's going to cost them more, uh, but uh, it depends on the services you provide. You know, uh, in, in, in Reg BI, I'm getting on a slight tangent. Uh, they, they, for the first time, really start to put more emphasis on investment cost as well uh, to, to act in the best interest of the client as a, as a broker under Reg BI. Uh, and, but they emphasize, and this is true as an ERISA fiduciary as well, you don't always have to recommend the lowest cost investment. So in other words, if, if you have more of an inv- active uh, management philosophy, uh, obviously, uh, the investment uh, options that you uh, select are probably going to be more expensive, or it's going to take more, more, more of your time, as opposed to a passive investment strategy and using index funds and all of that. Uh, but there's no prohibition or requirement, uh, prohibition on active management or requirement that you always select the lowest uh, investment option. Uh, you know, so you can, you know, if, if they need a, a micro cap, micro cap or a, a small cap investment, that's going to have a have a higher uh, investment cost than uh, S and P five hundred and and all these kind of things. But you have to just be careful and document the basis for why a, a more expensive investment option uh, is 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 being recommended. Things like that. Okay. So. Yeah. So it strikes me that if you're an advisor who's giving lots of rollover advice, that you might need um, a, a template that evaluates different factors like, I don't know, cost of the funds, number of funds available, creditor protection, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and looking at all the pros and cons of leaving it where it is or rolling it over and then documenting that for the client file. And, and you know, with uh, uh, some, uh, some of my clients, I've done checklists for them on rollovers. Uh, you know, what do you need to look at? Uh, that's, uh, you know, a, a reason to stay in the plan if you can, you know, if you're, if you're leaving, yeah. if you're, if you're leaving the employer, uh, you know, there's some advantages, uh, again, to staying in the plan. And there may be other reasons uh, uh, to, to leave, to stay, to move to either roll over to another plan or roll over to an IRA, et cetera. Um, it, but it's the same way with switching accounts. Uh, so forgetting about rollovers, uh, uh, again, uh, just, uh, now I'm getting more into reg BI territory, but, uh, you know, maybe you're do, you know, most advisors are duly registered, uh, as an, uh, you know, with an investment advisor, uh, side and, and the broker side. And so you may be talking to, uh, a new client. And, uh, and the SEC gets into a lot of discussion on this, uh, what capacity, uh, are you acting uh, under Reg BI or, or under the Advisors Act and so forth? And so that's a facts and circumstances test. And that just gets back to the point that uh, not so much with the IA marketing rule that we just talked about, there's not a lot of overlap. That's at least that's straightforward. You're an investment advisor, here's what you have to deal with. But when you get into the Department of Labor's uh, new rule, uh, you know, and uh, exemption for conflicted, safe harbor for conflicted advice, you're probably wearing at least two hats 
well, you have to be wearing at least two hats. You know, uh, you, you're wearing your ERISA hat and you're either acting as an insurance, you're, you know, maybe you work for a bank uh, or, you know, broker, dealer, investment advisor. So you really have to uh, make sure you understand uh, uh, what overlaps. And, and if somebody says, well, what do I do? Especially since, you know, we're seeing all these changes in administration. So you're probably going to see the Biden administration tight, tighten up its, its regs. They probably have a few things in the IA marketing rule that they want to change. Uh, Reg BI, they're probably going to do some things in there. So, but if you operate at the highest standard uh, among the areas that, uh, that you are, uh, that are applicable to the advice you're giving, uh, not to mention, you know, if you're a SEMA <laughs> or a CBWA or a CFP, et cetera, you have those higher uh, private sector standards that you need to. So the, so the default is basically operating at the highest standard that comes into play. And then there's a good chance uh, that you're not going to have any problems with any of the other regulatory overlap that that comes into play. But it does get confusing because I, I know a lot of uh, folks have at least two different licenses and in, in all of that. Yeah. So uh, remind me, um, the new rule is effective when and uh, and the safe harbor is available until when? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think I mentioned that. So thanks. Uh, the, the Department of Labor's uh, rule actually went into effect February sixteenth, but you can still use the impartial conduct standards, which is the temporary enforcement policy. That's called, uh, I think it's called FAB Field Advisory Bulletin twenty eighteen dash o two, until uh, twelve months from now, uh, or twelve months after it was went into effect, so around February sixteenth of next year, you can rely on that the impartial conduct standards uh, as a safe harbor, which is probably a good way to. And, and that's what the, the SEC and the Department of Labor is doing. They they want to give advisors uh, yeah. a, a, a substantial uh, transition period to make sure they get their new compliance systems in place. So for uh, the advisor rule, it's eighteen months. Uh, starting from May 4th. And for the Department of Labor rule, it's, you know, uh, just about 11 months uh, yeah. for, for getting your compliance in order. Yeah. So my, my guess is if you work for a large firm, Merrill Lynch, UBS, um, their compliance departments are, they're, are they're pretty all over, Yeah, yeah, they're right. all over that. And uh, uh, they're going to uh, give, give you the kind of guidance you need. Uh, but if you're a smaller independent firm, uh, you, you know, obviously, uh, you made a decision to not have a back office or, or to have, a, say, a compliance person on retainer, and you probably have to do a little bit more ho homework on your own. Right. And if you're an RIA and you custody at Schwab or Fidelity or... Um or Pershing, yeah, hopefully they're giving you some guidance. Yeah, too, right? they'll probably have some uh, handouts and, and maybe some, some webinars. One thing I did forget, to, going back yeah. to the advisor rule, uh, I know most, uh, most of your audience is, is probably going to be registered with the SEC as investment advisor. Uh, the, the marketing rule doesn't apply if you're state registered investment advisor. You have to look at state rules. Now, what's the, the other tricky part is, I don't think it's a lot of states, but if you're registered with some states, like I think Ohio, they will incorporate by reference in their law uh, SEC rules in some areas. So you might be okay with the testimonials in some states, but if not, the the uh, it's called their model unethical business practices rule that the states have in place. They're like the SEC was from 1961. They ban <laughs> testimonials, <laughs> so it's just it helps it helps keep me employed. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry to say that, but keeping track of all this stuff that's going on. Well, so I, I, I guess two questions come to mind. One is, as you think about Reg BI, the Labor Department rule, the current administration, do you see efforts to harmonize um, more so than in years past, or? Is that sort um, of a... I, well, you know, I, I think the Obama administration uh, went through that and uh, they I, I think it was partly because uh, Mary Jo White was SEC uh, chairman at the time and uh, Phyllis Borzy was uh, was assistant, assistant secretary of the Department of Labor. They were both busy. They were in their own silos. Mary Jo White, she was an enforcement person. She 
wasn't really looking that much at uh, coming up with a, a higher standard for brokers. So they were just in their own silos doing their own things. Uh, and, and the industry complained over that. And they said, let the SEC take the lead. So I think in the Trump administration, there was more attention to coordinating these rules but they're all locked in to a certain extent by what the statutes them th themselves say. So I, I hate to say it, but until you, you know, until it gets to the point where all these different regulations pile up and you have barnacles uh, that just become so frustrating, uh, I'll just go back real quick and say, uh, this is back under the Bush two administration. They kind of started to look and look at major reform and say, we should just break it up between um, uh, basically banking rules and sales rules and put everything under one or the other. But that's going to be a huge cat fight because, you know, every the states, uh, the agencies, they're all jealous of their jurisdiction. So if and when that ever happens, it's it's going to take years for Congress to be able to uh, come up with, with what you might call sense rules. Here's what you do for a retirement account. <laughs> They'll probably yeah. just forget about, just have one standard for whether it's a taxable account or a retirement account. So here's, here's how you give advice, but that's way down the road, unfortunately, I think. Yeah. But they are, so they are, they, they are starting to, they're, they're converging on cross marketing of services and doing the same thing. So I think the regulators are starting to move out of their bunkers a little bit and, and uh, talking, uh, talking to, to other regulators. Yeah. So uh, if memory serves, I think you wrote a little uh, a primer on Reg BI when it came out for the Institute members. Um, uh, will you be writing something similar with respect to the marketing rule or the uh, Labor Department rule for, um, for the benefit of members? Yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can see uh, IWI wanting to do something like that. Yeah, I wrote something to say, here's... <laughs> <laughs> Here's how you harmonize your your <laughs> compliance under three different rules, and boy, that what that's not easy to write, and it's it's challenging. So uh, all I can say is, you know, it's uh, when I started in this, like I said, uh, actually 25 years ago in securities and financial services industry, uh, it's just every year things change so you got to stay on your toes <laughs> you did talk about job security a second ago um, <laughs> so before we wrap up is there anything that you've already mentioned that you want to just reemphasize, or anything that you haven't touched upon that you'd like to bring up before we wrap up uh well you know it's it's just kind of the the closure on this if you're doing the right things for your clients and and you i think it's important to develop a fiduciary culture uh, within your firm because you have sales regulation technically on the books as a broker and on the insurance side. And you had the, the advice law on the books for investment advisors as fiduciary, but the regulators are moving uh, inevitably towards a, an advice standard, even under their sales rules. So, Again, uh, operating under the highest standard is is the best way to kind of eliminate some of the headaches that are involved in trying to sometimes comply with three or four different laws for giving uh, the same kind of advice is, is all I can say. Yeah. Well, uh, Dwayne, this was an entirely complicated subject matter, and you've done a great job of uh, ex of uh, uncomplicating the complicated, uh, as always. Oh, Ho hopefully it helps a little bit, but uh, it's always it's always a pleasure, Bob. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Exceptional Advisor Podcast, brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or our website at www.investmentsandwealth.org forward slash podcast to get the latest episodes of our Exceptional Advisor podcast series. For additional resources, updates on events, and exclusive membership deals, visit www.investmentsandwealth.org.